Welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, we're so excited to have everyone here today. Um, it's gonna be a fun conversation. Um, everything we wish we learned in sex ed. Um, we have two of our amazing kind body providers with us today, Dr. Jasmine Pedroso, Dr. Anu, say it again. Katharison. Katharison. I was practicing before. I messed up. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Um, but we're so excited for everyone to join us this evening. Um, it's going to be a great conversation. Um, we have a, a handful of the Kind Buddy team here with us tonight, too. So feel free to drop any questions in the chat as the conversation is happening. Um, we'll be able to answer a few questions throughout the throughout the presentation. Then we'll also um, take a few, our providers, our doctors here, will take a few at the end. Um, if there's any questions that you don't feel comfortable asking publicly, please feel free to shoot them to anyone who has a kind body in their name. And we'll be sure that we um, share them with the doctors privately while we still get your answers, um, answer your questions answered. So it, as everyone continues to join the call, please drop in the chat where you're dialing in from. We're excited um, to see where everyone is. Beach, great, awesome. Oakland, Anaheim, great. We got a lot of our Southern uh, California folks here, which is awesome because our two providers tonight are here um, calling in from San Francisco and from LA. So if you're in the area, you'll definitely um, have to make an appointment to see them in person. Brooklyn, I'm in New York myself. Minnesota, we just opened there. Northern California, great. Awesome, awesome. I'm gonna give it a cup, uh, just another more minute here and then we'll get started. Um, again, welcome to everyone joining now. Excited to have you. San Francisco. Great, okay. Well, welcome everyone again. Thrilled to have you here. Thrilled to have um, this opportunity to speak about all the things we wish we had learned in sex ed together. Um, we are joined first by um, lovely Dr. Jasmine Pedroso, who again is in San Francisco. Uh, next slide. Um, so she's going to kick off the conversation for us here. Um, so I'll pass it off to you. Thank you, Jasmine. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today on today's talk. I'm so excited to be talking about sex today. Um, I'm Dr. Jasmine Pedroso. I am a kind body's gynecologist and a minimally invasive surgeon in the San Francisco clinic at 88 Sutter. And um, we are also joined by um, Dr. Anu Katharisan. I think I got it right, who is our REI specialist in LA. Um, and uh, I just wanna remind you that this is an open and um, uh, safe conversation. I want you to know that there is no question that's too taboo. So please don't be shy. Um, we're here to answer whatever questions you have. But a little bit about Kind Body. You can go to the next slide. So Kind Body is a collective of women's fertility specialists, surgeons, OBGYNs, NPs, uh, physician assistants, and we're on a mission to make fertility care more accessible for all, regardless of uh, where you come from, what your background is, your financial status. We want to increase access for all. And we serve patients directly through their own insurance providers, or if you have a family benefit, um, a fertility benefit through us, we, we like to, we can help you as well. So some of the things um, that we do, um, there are several things. Our main thing that we do is we focus on fertility. And so we can actually talk to you about um, how we can prepare for pregnancy, how to prepare for trying to get pregnant. And so we do fertility assessments. We can do this in person or virtual. We also do egg freezing. We do embryo banking. We do insemination. We do IVF. We coordinate with donor eggs, donor sperm, surrogates. We can do genetic testing. And we've recently incorporated at-home fertility testing. In terms of the gynecology side, we like to say we're not just taking care of you in order to, for you to get pregnant. We're also taking care of the whole woman. So we do general gynecology as well. So we can do your pap smears if you're coming in for infections, urinary tract infections, contraception, 
if you have specific issues like endometriosis, pelvic pain, um, fibroids, PCOS, or other um, sort of women's health issues, we're happy to help. Um, and then surrounding fertility and gynecology, that is something very important to us in terms of access um, to services is wellness, nutrition, mental health, and access for our LGBTQ um, uh, patients who may need surrogates, donors, you know, we coordinate all of that. And so moving on to the meat of our discussion today, um, if we can go to the next slide. Again, I don't want you to um, feel ashamed of any question that you might have. We are here completely to support you. So um, if you have any questions, please chime in on the chat and we'll try to get those answered as soon as possible. But I do wanna dive in to um, the topic of conversation. We're gonna talk about sex. So when it comes to sex, uh, in terms of fertility, you know, sex is obviously one of the most important things, but it's just one way to get pregnant. It doesn't actually have to involve sex at all. If you don't have a partner, we can talk about donors. We can talk about insemination with donors. But in terms of sex as a side um, of, you know, um, aside from fertility, we want to make sure that you have a healthy sex life and that sex can be something that's actually good for your health and not just fertility. So unlike what most of us are grown up with, we grow up with this notion that it's bad and it's scary and, and um, you know, we can get pregnant, and, you know, as a career woman, I'm sure, um, you know, a lot of you have felt um, those kinds of pressures, but I don't want you to ever feel bad about having sex, wanting to have better sex, especially with regards to trying to build your family. But we have to make sex right for us. How do we make sex good for us? So go ahead and go to the next slide. It all starts with just having a good mentality about sex, a good attitude towards sex. Know that coming from an OBGYN, sex is actually really good for our health. So it increases, you know, uh, it boosts your immune system, it decreases your blood pressure, it decreases your stress levels. Um, it helps to keep your hormones in balance in terms of estrogen and progesterone. It actually improves your libido, especially when you have good experiences with sex, you're gonna want more sex. And it's actually a form of exercise. So about five calories a minute. So the longer, the better. Oops, my room went dark. One second. And in terms of um, decreasing pain and improving quality of sleep, it's one of those other things that we can do. Sorry, I'm just going to fix my, my lighting here. Oh. I'm going to go into the next room. Okay. And also, of course, it improves quality of sleep. Go, go ahead and go to the next slide. So what makes for good sex? So the most important thing I wanna get across from these slides today is that it's very, very important in order to have good sex, we have to know about our bodies. So one of those things that can actually help us to understand our bodies better in order to have good sex is a well woman exam. And this is the same exam we call kind of a pap smear, but a pap smear is so much more than just taking some cells from the cervix. A well woman exam is basically where you go to your OBGYN or your primary care doctor, and we undress you completely, put you in a robe, and we do a complete clinical breast exam. We do this every year, we recommend it every year. And then we do a pelvic exam, and that entails putting a speculum in to take a look at the inside of the vagina. It entails taking some samples from the cervix itself. It entails looking at the outside of the vagina to examine the labia, the clitoris, and all of that. And it also involves removing all those instruments and actually feeling the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. And if there are big abnormalities, for example, things like fibroids, ovarian cysts, those are things that we can actually feel sometimes. And so it's important that um, people come in for their annual well woman exams. One of the other things that um, we encourage also is not just getting examined by someone else like a professional, but also self-exploration and masturbation. 
we know that women who masturbate and women who are comfortable with their bodies and kind of know what feels good to them have better sex lives and have better, more satisfying um, sexual encounters. The other thing is open communication and honesty, not just with yourselves and with your partners, but also your medical providers. If you are having difficulty orgasming, if you are having pain with sex, if you are having, um, you know, issues surrounding, um, you know, um, just the idea of sex because of past traumas, those kinds of things, please talk to us, talk to your providers to see um, if there are anything um, uh, you know, mental health wise or physical that we can actually explore with you. And lastly, very important, when it comes to good sex, knowledge of your body, but also your fertility is extremely important. Um, sometimes women will have anxiety surrounding sex because they're not sure if they are ovulating and um, whether or not they can get pregnant or if they get pregnant, what's going to happen if they don't desire pregnancy. So all of those things are very, very important. Even before the clothes come off, um, knowledge of your body, open communication and control of your fertility. So we went over this a little bit in terms of a well woman exam. These are things that, again, we can do at any kind body. We can do um, your clinical breast exam, your pelvic exam, your pap smear. We can just make sure that everything is all healthy. And again, we can have a conversation about what um, issues you might be having or um, what abnormalities you might um, want to kind of just review with us. But going further, into the anatomy. So one thing um, that's very important that we don't really learn in um, you know, our sex ed class, I know for me growing up is um, you know, what, what are our pelvic organs? So um, let's just kind of fun fact here. Um, the vagina um, actually has different nerves in the lower vagina and um, versus the upper vagina. The upper vagina feels more pressure. The lower vagina actually feels more sort of sensitive pain. And so um, that's why when you put a tampon in the vagina, if you push it all the way up, you don't really feel it too much. But let's actually start with this picture here on the right. Let's talk about our ovaries. As, as fertility specialists, the ovaries are extremely important to us because they are where our estrogen and progesterone actually come from. And those hormones are stimulated to be secreted by these ovaries by hormones that are actually coming from the brain. So the, these um, ebbs and flows of the estrogen and progesterone, as most of us know, will kind of dictate when you ovulate, when you have your period, um, and sometimes it'll um, also dictate mood if you have um, issues with PMS. But unlike this drawing here, the ovaries are actually connected to the uterus and to their own blood supply as well. And they kind of hang off the side of the uterus, almost like dangly little earrings, so they can actually move around. And so when we go through things like um, egg freezing, for example, when the eggs get a little swollen or when we have ovarian cysts, the ovaries can actually turn on themselves and that can be very painful. The fallopian tubes, um, Think of those fallopian tubes as the tunnel from the uterus to the ovaries. And in order for us to get pregnant, those tubes have to be open for the sperm to swim through, through the vagina, into the uterus, into the tubes to meet the egg. In terms of the uterus, once the little egg meets the sperm in the fallopian tube, it then uh, has to kind of descend back down into the uterus and implant itself in the wall of the uterus. And that's how that little embryo gets its blood supply and starts growing and creates its own placenta. And so the uterus, think of that's where the baby would grow. So sometimes, um, you know, uh, we'll have abnormalities like fibroids, which are benign tumors of the uterus that sometimes need to be removed in order for us to get pregnant. Um, sometimes we'll have polyps, which are just overgrowths of the glandular cells on the inside of the uterus. Um, and that will help us, um, you know, just kind of knowing whether or not we have those things will help us to understand whether or not they're going to be in the way of our fertility. But the uterus is a pretty amazing organ. It can actually stretch up to 500 times its normal size. And a normal size 
uh, uterus is about the size of a woman's fist, so about six to seven centimeters or so. Now, the vagina, the vagina is, again, very different than the schematic here. It's not just, you know, a tube. It is actually a very, very mobile, stretchy, and strong muscle. Um, and it actually stretches almost like an accordion. It actually opens like this and stretches and elongates during arousal. And just like penile tissue, it can actually get engorged during arousal as well. The lubrication that we actually have during arousal and during sex, it comes from fluid that actually exudates from the walls of the vagina. So some people think it's actually coming from the cervix and after hysterectomy, they don't have any more lube. That's actually not true. The, the lube is coming from the vagina itself and pushing, again, pushes through the walls of the uterus. So most people think that the vagina is our sexual organ as females, but as women, we know that we actually have many sexual organs. We can go to the next slide. So my favorite sexual organ, the clitoris. The clitoris um, is actually the equivalent to the head of a penis. And so embryologically, when we are actually developing in the womb, whether or not we have testosterone to develop into an actual penile shaft will determine whether or not we have a clitoris versus, a, versus a, um, the head of a penis. But just like the penis, the clitoris actually has many parts there's the clitoral shaft, almost like the, the, um, the head of the penis, but the clitoris also has legs. I don't know if we, we call them um, clitoral legs that are actually um, on the sides of the vagina, so within the labia. And in the same way that the uh, penis can actually engorge with blood and get erect, the clitoris can do that too. So the labia get engorged, um, the clitoris can get engorged and all of that is part of that arousal process. And, um, luckily we're 50% uh, more sensitive than a penis. And so for a lot of women, the clitoris is, um, the more dominant, um, um, organ or of orgasm. And this is why it's, it's important that we actually know this. And so kind of going back to exploring our own bodies, Sometimes we, we've never explored the clitoris. Maybe we've never looked in the mirror. Um, and uh, if you wanted to, to explore one day, um, again, this is kind of where you would find it. It would be around the labia at the very top of the, um, of, uh, the vulva. And again, the, the clitoral legs would be within the labia on the sides of the vagina. We can go to the next slide. So just like we have many pelvic organ or many pelvic organs and many um, uh, orga or organs for um, sexual pleasure, there's also many ways to orgasm. And that's because of the nerves that actually innervate the vulva, vagina, vag and, um, and clitoris. They all come from a nerve called the pudendal nerve. And that nerve actually descends through and around the rectum. So some women can actually orgasm through anal intercourse or anal stimulation. Some women can orgasm through vaginal stimulation, G-spot stimulation, clitoral stimulation, uterine stimulation. There are so many ways to organ or orgasm because we have so many sexual organs all innervated by this pudendal nerve that, that kind of dictates our orgasm. And we can go to the next slide. So in terms of um, one of the main ways that women will have more internal orgasms is the G-spot. The G-spot, they call it the graphene spot. It's not a spot. It's not like this microscopic thing that's hard to find. It's actually a cluster of nerves in a bundle at the top of the vagina. So just like in the schematic, it's just a few centimeters behind the uh, clitoris, behind the bladder. And so, um, you know, about half a finger, maybe a quarter finger um, inside at the top of um, the vagina is where you'll find it. And it's, it doesn't really feel too different um, than regular tissue, but um, after stimulation, it definitely gives more of a 
um, release of endorphins and dopamine and um, typically ends in a very, very powerful orgasm. Now, something very interesting about um, the G spot, the G spot is actually where in a male equivalent, um, the prostate would be. So embryologically, we think that the prostate and the G spot um, kind of come from the same sort of bundle of nerves. And um, in women who have undergone um, a gender affirmation surgery, they can actually still orgasm through this area even after surgery because that's where the prostate um, basically is. Now, in terms of, again, how do we make sex work for us? We've already gone through some of the basics of our anatomy, and I know that was a very quick overview. But again, it goes back to experimentation, honest communication. One of the best ways to actually learn more about your body is not just making sure it's healthy and checking it out, getting your annual exam, and um, kind of going over what the anatomy is supposed to look like, but also, knowing what your likes and dislikes and limitations are by directed masturbation. And what that means is masturbating with a knowledge of your anatomy, masturbating with tools that may or may not um, uh, stimulate arousal and orgasm, and then honestly and openly communicating that with either your partner or your provider if there's any issues. Um, now, one thing I do want to acknowledge, and I'll pass it on to Dr. Anu, would be that sex for the purposes of fertility, it can actually be, it can feel very different because we're used to having sex for fun. But when it's not, when, when it's sex for baby making, it can actually be extremely stressful, um, which is why we like to uh, treat the whole woman, especially focusing on mental health as we go through these fertility journeys. Um, and baby making sex can be extremely stressful so much so that, you know, you you have zero libido. And we definitely see those couples sometimes where they've been trying for years and sex is a chore now. We don't want you to have that kind of experience. We want you to know your body, know that sex is fun regardless of whether or not you can have a baby, but also that um, there are ways to um, mitigate the stress around baby making. And so I'll actually pass on to Dr. Um, Anu and um, to talk about fertility. Oh, I think um, I think you're on mute, Dr. Anu. Okay, great. I was having some trouble unmuting myself. Um, hi, everyone. Just a quick intro again. I'm an infertility specialist in Los Angeles. So happy to be here. That was an amazing um, review on sexual health from Jasmine. I wish I had gotten that in my youth. Um, I think there's a lot that we don't talk about. And similarly, when it comes to fertility, I think there's a lot of... Um, not necessarily good foundation when it comes to fertility education and fertility awareness. So I'm happy to be here to talk about that today. Um, I think one of the most important things I want you to take away from this, from the fertility perspective, that it's really important to educate ourselves on fertility, the impact of age and what that has on fertility and um, considering getting evaluated and seeing where you stand and then seeing what your options are and then just making the best decisions from there. You can go to the next slide. Okay. So we're often taught in our youth to avoid pregnancy and contraceptive options. And, um, but then when it comes to actually trying to start our family and trying to conceive, there's a lot of um, unknowns. And I think that um, people sometimes often don't know where to begin. They don't know how the menstrual cycle works and when ovulation occurs and um, when is the most fertile time to conceive. And there's a lot of misinformation and myths out there. So again, I think it's really important to educate ourselves early on. You can go to the next slide. 
Okay, so some things that are um, that we feel do impact fertility and are good to do in preparation when you're trying to conceive are healthy lifestyle. So I always recommend a Mediterranean diet, lots of fruits and vegetables, um, healthy fats like avocado, olive oil, poultry, fish, this type of thing. And then exercise, just trying to do what you can to stay healthy. Usually I say three to four times a week, a good cardio for 30 minutes, intermittent weights, and just trying to do what you can to have a, a healthy mindset. And of course, trying to minimize alcohol, avoiding smoking, drugs, um, and those type of things. And um, in addition, family history. So it's important to talk to your healthcare provider about your family history. Sometimes some um, patients are genetically predisposed to certain conditions, so it's good to get evaluated and uh, make sure if there's something that you need to be aware about before embarking on the fertility journey that you're aware of it. And then also just trying to take care of our mental health and um, trying to have a good um, well-being when it comes to mental health. So I usually tell patients to try and indulge in the things that bring you self-care and joy and whatever that may be, whether it's meditation or acupuncture or walks with your partner, but trying to just make sure you're taking care of your mental health when you're going through the fertility journey. You can go to the next slide. So when it comes to fertility, the most important thing to think about is the woman's age. And there is a decline in egg number and egg quality as we get older. Go to the next slide. Okay, so first to touch on what happens to egg numbers um, as we get older. So we are born with a certain number of eggs and unfortunately that number declines over time. And um, when we have the most eggs is actually when we're still in utero in our mom's belly and that's around six to 7 million. And then by the time we're born, that number has already dropped to one to 2 million eggs. By the time we reach puberty, it's about 300,000 to 400,000 eggs. And then by the time we reach menopause, it's less than a thousand eggs. And each cycle, we're losing not just one egg, but we're losing a whole set of eggs. And in our, the course of our reproductive lifespan, we will only ovulate about 400 eggs. And so all those millions of eggs otherwise die off. And um, unfortunately, we don't regenerate eggs. So once our pool of eggs is depleted, there's nothing that we can do to reverse that process. You can go to the next slide. Okay. And you often hear this number 35 as some kind of um, important um, age where things shift. And um, as we mentioned earlier, there's going to be a gradual decline in egg number as we get older, or um, sorry, decline as we get older. And so that decline will occur um, throughout that time. And then we see a more pronounced decline around the, our age, um, like our, in our early 30s, and then a more dramatic decline around age 35. So that process is gradually happening um, throughout that time. And within each age, I kind of think of it as there can be a spectrum too. There can be women that fall on the higher side and then women that fall on the lower side. And so it's not often, but we, we sometimes do see women even in their early thirties where their ovarian reserve is lower than we anticipate. And it's about a rate of one in 10 women where we see that. Now to touch on the other um, point. So with the decline in egg number, there's also a decline in egg quality as we get older. And so there's gonna be an increased proportion of genetically abnormal eggs as we get older. The reason is, is that when um, an egg is being made, the chromosomes are dividing and in the pr processes of meiosis. And so as we get older, there is more errors in that division process. So then we end up with eggs that have an abnormal number of chromosomes in them. And so when these types of eggs fertilize, um, get fertilized by a sperm, they end up with your outcome being a negative pregnancy test, a miscarriage, and sometimes a genetically abnormal offspring. You're never too young or too old to get evaluated. So I always think of fertility um, that you should be as um, treat it like any other disease where you want to be preventative. So uh, approach it um, with a preventative um, approach as well as a proactive approach to it. Okay, so when are we most fertile? So um, 
this starts with a good understanding of the menstrual cycle. And um, so a, an example that we can use is if a woman has a 28 day cycle, let's say there are two phases to the menstrual cycle, the follicular phase where the egg is growing and maturing and then ovulation that will occur. And then after that, the luteal phase. The luteal phase is what generally is consistent in its time frame. And it's comes, it's it lasts for approximately 12 to 14 days. So if your cycles are 28 days, then the luteal phase you can estimate to be about 14 days. And so you can estimate that you ovulate around cycle day 14. And so the fertile window is going to be the five days that precedes that. Now, if your cycles are, let's say, 35 days, you're going to have to adjust the time frame where your fertile window is. So again, if your cycles are 35 days, you would subtract 14. So that's approximately cycle day 21, where you would ovulate. And then the five days prior to that being the fertile window. So during the fertile window, this is your most fertile time. So this is the time to have intercourse every one to two days to maximize your chances of success. How does ovulation work? So I describe um, this kind of this way to patients. Your eggs are locked away, uh, locked away in a ball where we can't see them. And then every month, a certain number are released and become visible. And that's your antral follicle count, what we'll assess on transvaginal ultrasound. So each month when those um, eggs are released, the brain will send a signal to the ovary to stimulate one of those eggs to grow, one of the follicles with the egg within it to grow. And that egg will eventually ovulate. The rest of the eggs that were recruited that cycle will die off. And then the next cycle, another set come. So it's important again to realize you're not just losing one egg that, that month, but you're losing a whole set of eggs. And sex. Um, so this is also a common question that we get when it comes to um, trying to conceive. Is there a position that's more favorable? Um, any particular tips when it comes to sex? So first of all, you can have intercourse every day or every other day during the fertile window. There's not going to be a dramatic difference in success rates. Um, I usually tell patients just try and do what you can to make it as um, as less stress as possible because because it, it can be a stressful process when you're trying to time intercourse and uh, maximize your chances when you're trying to conceive. But when it comes to sexual positions, there's no position that has been shown to be more successful when you're trying to conceive. Whether or not you're having an orgasm also does not impact success rates. And um, again, you just want to try and do what you can to take the stress off while you're going through your fertility journey. So another option alternatively would be to do ovulation predictor kits where if you're trying to um, kind of decrease the amount of sex that you're having and trying to target more particularly where you need to have intercourse and you could have intercourse on the day of the LH surge and the following day, and that would also be sufficient. And then it's important to keep in mind that anal sex, oral sex, um, these type of um, means of intercourse are not gonna result in a baby. If it's um, painful when you're having intercourse, that can also make it challenging to conceive. And then if you're single or in a same sex um, uh, partnership that you can come to a fertility clinic and we can discuss options for you with how to conceive in those circumstances. The definition of infertility. So um, first is that you always want to make sure your sites are regular and that there's no known infertility factors. If those are the case, then you want to go ahead and see a fertility specialist because if you're not having regular cycles, that would imply you're not ovulating. Or if there's a known infertility factor, it would make sense to go ahead and um, seek assistance. Now, aside from these um, circumstances, when you're under the age of 35, you can technically try for a year um, before meeting that diagnosis of infertility and it being reasonable to see an infertility specialist to get further work up. If you're over the age of 35, then um, you could try for six months and then it's reasonable to go ahead and come see a fertility specialist. And fertility is a very common disease. It occurs in about one in eight couples. And um, it's important to consider what the causes of infertility can be. About a third of the time, it can be due to the woman, but a, about a third of the time, it can be due to the man. And there are also circumstances where there can be uh, infertility factors relating to both the man and the woman. So it's important to make sure 
um, both partners in the couple are getting evaluated. And if you are wanting to get evaluated earlier, just to make sure everything looks okay, that's also reasonable too. So at the end of the day, there's no magic formula. Every couple is different. So it's important to get evaluated and see where you stand and then discuss options with your provider so that you can make the best decisions for you. So this starts with a um, infertility or an initial consult with your infertility specialist. So we'll meet with you one-on-one, -on -one. we'll go over your history, we'll go over medical problems, surgeries, what medicines you're on, um, if any allergies to medication, family histories, um, if you smoke, drink, and these type of things. So we'll review all of these things as part of your evaluation. In addition, we'll go over your family planning goals. And then after that, based on your evaluation and also based on your goals, we'll come up with a plan that best um, suits your needs. So another part of the evaluation is going to be um, looking at ovarian re reserve. So this is an important component of the evaluation. And we usually check ovarian reserve in um, two ways. So one is with a blood test called an AMH. This stands for anti-mullerian hormone. It's a hormone produced by the cells that surround the follicles. And this tells us about egg number, not necessarily quality. The other means that we assess ovarian reserve is going to be with um, something called an antral follicle count. So this is that number that we were saying of the follicles that are released each month. So we can assess this on a transvaginal ultrasound. And so both of these, again, tell us about egg number, not necessarily the quality. The quality is gonna be more related to the woman's age. And after we um, meet and discuss options, discuss what your goals are, we'll go over options. So some of those options, for example, if a woman is um, single, but thinking about her fertility and wanting to be proactive in helping to increase the chances of having biological children in the future, one option would be to go ahead and freeze eggs. Mm -hmm. Another option would be embryo freezing. Um, sorry, mm -hmm. somebody talking. Okay, okay. I'll keep going. <laughs> um, another option is embryo freezing. So um, with embryo freezing, that a uh, circumstance where that might be um, used in, let's say, a couple who are wanting children, but, wanting children, but not necessarily ready for um, starting their family right at that time. And so freezing embryos would be something that would help to increase their chances of meeting their family goals later on. And then there's other fertility treatment options, such as IUI and IVF. So again, um, I would say every woman and couple, they have their individual path. So it's important to try and educate yourself, learn about your fertility, see where you stand, get evaluated, and then um, learn about your options so that you can make the best decisions for you. And so um, sometimes financial aspects of this can be a limiting factor. We're happy to give you here some discount codes. Um, so $100 off the assessment and then $500 off of egg freezing or IVF and $200 off of an IUI cycle. All right, that's all I had. I'll open up to any questions that you guys have. Thank you so much. Um, if people want to throw some questions in the chat, we can take them. I'll also start to read off a few that I've received while we, um, while you guys were walking through the presentation. Um, one that I got was why do prenatals make some women break out so badly? And what are some ways to use prenatals with breaking out? Nobody likes bad skin. Jasmine, is that one you could take for us? No, I think we might have lost Jasmine. We can come back to that one. Um, <clears throat> oh, no worries. Um, is urinating after sex helpful to prevent UTIs? Okay. Oh, I'll no. break. 
sorry, it's it's Jasmine. I can go back to that other one. Um, um, not all prenatal, prenatal vitamins. Vitam oh, can you guys hear me? Um, not all prenatal vitamins are going to um, result in breakout, but sometimes when women come off of their birth control or off of something called spironolactone that a lot of women use for um, uh, treatment of acne, when they come off of that in order to get pregnant, your hormones go back to their normal baseline. And um, if the hormone birth control was actually helping with the acne, and now you're back to your normal baseline hormones, it's actually not the prenatal vitamins, it's the lack of birth control that um, cause a lot of people to break out. So one thing that you can do as an experiment is just change the brand of um, a prenatal vitamin that you're using. Each one has different kinds of additives. Um, we sell um, prenatal gummies on our website if you wanted to give those a try. But um, again, typically it's coming off the birth control where women will um, tend to have the hormonal changes that increase the risk of acne. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, if everyone, if you are interested in our prenatals, we do have those. They're at shop.kindbody.com. So easy to find if you're interested. Um, also available in our clinics. Um, the next question we had was, is urinating after sex helpful to prevent UTIs? Yes. So anything that will help to flush the urine is going to help to prevent UTIs. Um, that can mean peeing after sex, peeing before sex, drinking plenty of water. Basically, we want this to be um, where the, the bladder is constantly kind of free flowing and, and emptying out so that the urine doesn't stay stagnant. Stagnant urine, um, you know, when you hold your urine and just things are kind of just allowed to fester, it allows um, bacteria the time to reproduce. And so um, urinating often um, uh, definitely urinating after sex can help prevent urinary tract infections, but, um, it's always good to also get checked out to make sure that the infection is completely cleared if you're having any, um, specific symptoms. And does urinating after sex, um, have any impact on your chances of getting pregnant? No. So the urine will actually come out of the urethra, which is near the vagina, but the, the, um, but the um, ejaculation for pregnancy should happen near the cervix towards the top of the vagina. And, um, you know, so urinating is not going to necessarily wash away the sperm that's already um, in the vagina. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. Great. Um, here is another one. Where was I? Um, can we talk about the anatomy involved in anal sex? And is it possible for women to feel pleasure during anal sex? Yes. So going back to, I don't know if we, we want to go back to that slide, but the same nerves that um, will detect pleasure and um, sensation at the clitoris, the vulva, the G-spot, it's all the same nerve. And depending on your particular brand, this, this slide, here we go, um, that one, um, depending on your, um, how your, your um, um, anatomy is innervated, yes, women can actually have, um, you know, more orgasm or better orgasms with um, anal intercourse. It all kind of depends on um, their bodies. And so, you know, um, uh, you know, my, my suggestion is, you know, if you feel like that's something you want to explore, um, you know, definitely with a little bit of um, guidance and some lube and some toys, um, it can be something that um, can give fantastic orgasms. But it all really depends on your own anatomy. Great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Anu, I've got a question for you. How can one predict when they're going to ovulate um, and if someone's struggling to figure out when they're ovulating, what should, what are the next steps they should take? Oh, she's on mute. Okay. So, um, predicting when you ovulate. So first is making sure you have regular cycles. And so, and knowing what your average cycle length is. So if your cycle length average, um, is 30 days, then you would subtract 14 approximately from that 30 days. And that would be approximately when you ovulate. So cycle day 16. 
um, and uh, if your cycles are irregular, then that would imply you may not be ovulating. And so then it would make sense to see a fertility specialist and get further work up and get assistance with helping you to, to ovulate. Um, alternatively, you can try ovulation predictor kits. I usually would recommend kind of starting them at, at the beginning of that fertile window time. So maybe around like cycle day 10 or so until you're able to pick up when ovulation occurs. Oh, you're muted. I am. Yeah. Um, can, can women that turn 33 or 34 still get pregnant? I know the answer is yes, but let's go into a little bit more detail. Um, so yes, they can still get pregnant. Um, as long as your cycles are regular, as long as there is not a known infertility factor, you know, you guys can try for up to a year. Um, and again, if you're let's say you're getting frustrated after six months or so, you just wanna come in and check and see where things are. That's totally reasonable to do and, um, and you know, get checked out earlier. Um, sometimes women do have difficulty though, and it really, it's just hard to predict. It just really depends on our genetics and you know, how many eggs we were born with, let's say, in our ovarian reserve now. And, but it would be reasonable to, to try up to a year. But if you're wanting to come and get evaluated, see where things are, just be on the safe side, that would be okay too. Great. Anyone else have any questions? Um, Jasmine, Anu, anything that we didn't touch on here that you want to expand on a bit? Um, you know, as, as um, we come to a close, I do, um, again, want to encourage an open dialogue with your providers. I can't tell you how many um, stories I hear every day where if um, this pain with sex or the um, you know issues they're having with um, you know body image and um, their anxieties surrounding sex, I can't tell you how many patients um, have never talked to their providers before about this, and and they're finally these issues finally come up when they're trying to actually get pregnant. So I encourage you to have an open dialogue. Literally, there's nothing that an OBGYN has not seen or done, or um, there's there should be no barriers. Um, just imagine you're talking to one of your closest girlfriends and nothing leaves the room. Um, so um, if anyone is having issues surrounding fertility, surrounding sexuality, surrounding um, orgasm, or anything having to do with their pelvic anatomy, please come see us. We'd be happy to help. Yeah, thank you. I, I just would want to add to you in encouraging um, getting an assessment, potentially seeing where where you stand, but also just taking a step back and thinking about your overall family building goals. And sometimes we focus on trying to conceive baby number one, and we're not necessarily thinking about baby number two or baby number three, and what age we're starting off now, and just kind of thinking more of the full picture. So it's always good, I think, to have a conversation with a fertility specialist, just to try and talk these things out so that you're making thoughtful decisions on, um, on your next steps. Exactly. Sometimes many patients of ours use their embryos that they um, created, you know, before they conceive, conceive their first child naturally, and then they go on and they use these embryos for their second, third, fourth child. So it's important. It's important to think about that too. When do you want to have your first and when do you want to have your last and how many in between? <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys so much. If anyone has any additional questions, we're always here to help you. Um, navigator at kindbody.com. Thank you so much to our two wonderful providers. Take, thank you for taking time out of your afternoons, evenings to answer our questions and walk us through this presentation. It's so helpful. Um, I saw a few questions about the promo code. It is sexed22, but also you'll receive an email tomorrow with the promo code and a link to this presentation. So if you want to walk through it again, um, walk through it with your partner, um, it's available to you. So thank you so much. Um, and we'll see you in a kind buddy clinic soon. Have a great evening.